A warm welcome to everyone and um, thank you for that uh, practice, Richard. It's really great to see this combination of familiar faces and new faces. And that's the whole point of these gatherings is to bring together people who may not know each other, but are mutually interested in seeing more innovation within the mindfulness field. I'm going to start off with um, this saying. Who's heard this saying before? Maybe give me a, a nod or a, a thumbs up. Okay. So a few of you. Um, it is from someone called Werner Myers, who is a leading diversity and inclusion expert. And I love this quote of hers. It's, it's really helped me to differentiate the two terms. And why are we talking about this? I mean, beyond the moral, uh, ethical and legal reasons why inclusion is a good idea. There's also a very strong innovation case for it. There is a huge amount of research that shows that diverse communities, diverse sectors, diverse companies are more innovative because of the different perspectives, life experiences, strengths and networks people bring to them. When I um, first started working as an innovation specialist some 20 years ago, the cultural models we had about creativity and innovation were very much about the lone creative genius, you know, a person, usually a man, uh, in his shed or lab. And even today, if you type in the man who invented computers, the internet, cars, mindfulness, anything really, you'll get lots of results and lots of stories. And that's really important. There are far fewer stories in our culture about collaboration. But if you take um, a closer look at history, it gives us a very different understanding of the reality of how innovation really happens. And um, this here is a photograph of Apple's Steve Jobs, but also his co-founder Steve Wozniak working together, which is probably more representative of what an average day looked like for them. There um, are now lots of really inspiring models. This is a uh, diagram of theory U, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a meta model for innovation or, or transformation. It's based on the work of Otto Sharma, Peter Senge and others. When I first saw it presented many years ago, it was actually described as initiating, sensing, presencing, creating and evolving. And now it's nearly always presented in this more collaborative way to make the point clear. It was always about collaborative processes, but to really spell it out, to put the co in front there. And the essential skills for this work are, you know, active listening, conflict resolution, collective learning journeys, group decision making, because we know it really helps unleash creativity when very different people come together in the right way, in the right context. And frustratingly for the scientists and me, a lot of that is thanks to the intangible, the unexpected, the serendipitous connecting of dots that happens. And as the saying goes, one plus one always equals more than two. So let's go back to this idea of diversity and inclusion and travel one step further. What would it mean for someone not just to feel included, but to feel that they truly belong? I'm gonna give you a few moments to type some thoughts into the chat box. Like what are the first words that come to mind when you see this word belonging? Got safety. Being at home, trust, connection, acceptance, community, agency, feeling heard. Thank you. So maybe let's just see how far we can push this metaphor. Maybe belonging is uh, getting to choose the music, adding your own tracks to the playlist so you can actually authentically enjoy the music and, and, and feel like dancing. Um, maybe belonging is feeling comfortable not to dance and still feel included 
Maybe you have sensory issues and music and the lights just too much, or perhaps it goes against your cultural values. Whatever the reason, belonging is, is, is to have a legitimate and respected voice in the room, to be able to question the norms and switch things around. And importantly, to be able to invite other people in too. And when it comes to the field of mindfulness, we don't want people coming into the space to have to put aside their culture or way of thinking, their neurodivergence, their passions. We don't want people to try and fit in and act like others, you know, pretending that their course is just like um, the MBCT, if it's not, you know, masking differences, because diversity is exactly what we need to feed innovation. Sure, not all ideas will be effective, but we can try things out and support each other in the process. So why are we talking about all this? <laughs> why is this so important to me personally, to the Mindfulness Initiative, to our funding partners? And why are we here having this call together? We're living through some major social political crisis. It's heartbreaking and overwhelming to even switch on the news. Just think about the people in your own life. I mean, how many people in subtle ways are afraid or stressed, anxious, even battling with depression. It can be really hard uh, to feel well in ourselves these days, which in turn makes it harder to take on the larger perspectives and support others and to feel care, to feel connection. The image uh, here on the slide is, is a giant sculpture. I think it was 18 meters long a few years ago in, at the Burning Man. It's called Love. At this point in time, I think you'll all agree that we need more of this. We need more of a critical mass of us to be developing our inner resources for presence, for compassion. And we need for mindfulness not to be limited as an elite practice or as a white middle class thing or as a luxury. And for this, we need mindfulness training to keep evolving so that it can reach more people in creative new ways. So we started this work off about five years ago in a small way. Uh, talking to people from all parts of the field, uh, researching and developing a practical guidance document, the field book for mindfulness innovators. And the idea was well, just to encourage people to come into the space, develop new mindfulness offerings, test and improve them and, and build evidence for them. And this was really well received and encouraged us to, to, to keep going. So what have we been doing since? Um, We've had a number of online community events which have been growing in size and in what is a key metric for me diversity uh, we launched the innovation awards in 2022 to celebrate early stage projects and uh, i can see that a lot of um, the uh, award winners and the runners ups are, are represented here in the group it's great to see you all uh, the point here was that we wanted to to like honor uh, the, the risk that they were taking to to make mindfulness more accessible and impactful and in 2023 off the back of the awards program we created four films about innovations and if you haven't seen these i really recommend them they're on the mindfulness initiative youtube channel i'm not sure eileen if, if maybe you can put a link in but, um, uh, they're really great and now we are working on a a microsite is, and one of the one of the aspects of that is going to be a community blog page you know keeping it simple but it's it's just a place where we can start sharing more stories you know um beyond the, the award winners and um well the first one is from luke which uh, is an award winner he um is going to be uh, sharing his story uh with us soon and, and um I, his blog his blog post already tells me that uh we're all in for a treat today to hear his story in person. Early uh, next year, we are going to be releasing an updated version of the field book. And this is um, going to include uh, new advice and new case studies. So for example, there's a whole section in there about the Myriad study and what it's taught us about scaling or um, what it's taught us about how not to scale. Um, there's a section about more social forms of mindfulness and the evidence behind that. There's a section about the importance of designing for ethnic and racial inclusion. And we're also going to be having another uh, awards. So one of the learnings 
from last year's awards uh, is that it's hard to compare projects, you know, and um, sometimes it's like comparing apples and oranges. If we had more distinct categories, we could be more inclusive uh, in celebrating different kinds of projects. And, and so that's why we're currently developing three categories uh, this time. The first one is program. So, you know, we know the six week and eight week models work and there's so much potential for adaptations for different contexts, for different communities. The second category is mindfulness meets tech. This is an area that I work in personally, and I know a lot is emerging in the space. Approaches that specifically leverage new tech, wearables, uh, virtual reality, large language models, and other forms of AI to train people in mindfulness capacities. The third category is going to be around creative partnerships, both within and beyond the field of mindfulness. So this could be you know, an unusual research collaboration or um, a multi-industry collaboration. The more unlikely the allies, the better. And then there's a cross-cutting theme. So one of the key criteria last time was around collaboration, the quality of collaboration. And we're going to be emphasizing that even more this time. We um, are also looking at the application process itself, how to make it welcoming of people with different abilities, uh, different um, uh, you know, geographic uh, locations, neurodivergence. But at, at this point, um, it's going to be quite incremental, the improvements because of, of, of limitations around resource. But it's, it's something that we're quite sensitive to and uh, trying to, to, to make it as best as we can. Um, one of the things we considered is, is whether um, it, it, it's, this is ready to be a global awards, but, but we don't feel it is um, qu quite going to be um, ready for that, but we, we're looking into it. The plan is to open applications from March uh, to May next year, and more information will be shared in the run up to that. And uh, the in person ceremony was amazing last time, so rich in terms of conversations and connections. So we're hoping to replicate that uh, this time too. So that'll be uh, around September. And we're still looking for partners and sponsors for these awards. So do get in touch with me or, or Richard, uh, if that's something you'd like to be involved in. And um, that's it for today, although we will get more time to speak or answer questions in the plenary at the end. Just want to say thank you again for, for being part of this community, being here today. It's such a pleasure to serve this community in this way. Oh, I wanted to now introduce Luke because um, he is going to share his story, which I think all of you are going to find very inspiring. He is the founder of Mindful Peak Performance, uh, the co-creator of the BAM program, which won the 2022 Innovations in Mindfulness Awards with Flying Colors. I really love hearing from him. Uh, he's so grounded, so practical, and yet visionary. His um, work questions many of the accepted norms in the mindfulness space, and we're already seeing great benefits from um, his approach and shaking things up. Uh, so Luke, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this and the floor is yours. Thank you. So I think there's some slides that are gonna drop maybe behind my head in a moment. Can everyone see it? No? Just... Give me a we thumbs up. I can't see the slides behind your head, Lou. They should be coming any moment. Any moment. There we go. Thumbs up if you can see that. I can see you there, Tarashri. Can you uh, give me a thumbs up? Oh, yeah. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to talk about innovation and collaboration under three headings. The first one is collaborating with self, um, which is a bit of the, the wrestle and the journey that I went on to collaborate with my own conflicts inside myself, which gave rise to BAM, Boxing and Mindfulness, and then collaborating with the world around us and then trusting what emerges. Um, they feel like three resonant topics. So, and just to say this, this what I'm talking about is I've just been reflecting on my own experience. I've not got any theory that's going to underpin what I'm saying. It's literally stories and reflections from the last well, even 15 years that, that felt pertinent under these headings. So if we want to move to the first slide, which is collaborating with self. 
so a slightly embarrassing couple of pictures there. Um, so where I want to start with um, was the conflict, which I still live with, which is how do I live with the conflict of being a raw athlete, rugby player who has anger, who has lots of emotion with a very sensitive, quite delicate um, person. And if I go back to the start of my journey, um, when I was younger, my, you know, my goal was to play rugby for England. So I, when I was 11 or 12, I had this big, me and my friend Glenn, we had this, um, we set this goal, we're going we're gonna to play rugby for England. And, I, and then for the next 10 years or so, we just trained three times a day, sometimes seven, seven days a week, playing for four rugby teams at a time at one point. So rugby was my life and that was an amazing outlet for my energy um, to build friends. And yeah, just a big, a big uh, corner of my um my early life was sport and rugby particularly. I played rugby for England when I was 18 and then I stopped. Alongside that, I was really interested in ballet and wanted to be a ballet dancer at the same time. I never did pursue that, but I always had this contrast of being very sensitive and not really able to show that side of who I was as a rugby player and really aggressive and athletic. And that all got expressed in the, in the, in the rugby, but also, as I went on with rugby, it didn't, um, I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. Um, I would often throw up before playing. So there was, a, there was this, this kind of disjoint between the mask and the kind of athlete and then this sensitive uh, young person with a lot of mental health issues that weren't really understood. Um, and in my early 20s, two of my friends who went on to play professional rugby um, sadly committed suicide. And that really showed me the, what can happen um, when you have a very strong external mask and you're not able to let in uh, feelings, emotions, or understand that range, the range of feelings that might be going on when you're under a lot of pressure. So that was my sort of, um, yeah, my early, my early early life in a way was this, and still is this conflict between how do I balance these two, two aspects of myself. So I went on after rugby, after playing rugby for England, I then went into law, which was uh, really not a great idea because I didn't, feel it was me at all I went and did two degrees in law and took the same drive and uh, commitment that I took to rugby and just plowed into two degrees in law and got incredibly burnt out at the end of that in my heart I wanted to be an artist so I've always been um, I've always been a painter um, since I was about 15 years old and I've always done that and that's always been an amazing expression for my sensitivity and actually was my first way into meditation um, and I never really honored that so I did two degrees in law and then got completely burnt out um, I'm going to show you one of my pieces of art at this point, just to show you what the conflict was like, um, which I think is better than me describing it. So if you want to just move down to the second, third slide, this is a piece of art that I did um, in my early, yeah, many, many, many years ago. And I think you can see the the conflict in that. Somewhere in there, there's a, there's a meditator, there's a, there's a rugby player, and there's a quite a big wound in the middle. So this is my first point about collaborating with yourself. We've all got conflicting energies. We've all got various things we have to manage in our lives. And there's a lot of meaning in it if you're willing to face it. And if you've got the tools like meditation and mindfulness, being aware of those tensions and what they're trying to tell us about who we are and what unique gifts we've got to bring into the world is really where collaboration started for me. And, it, and it's taken me a long time to find the confidence and congruence to figure out how to bring these different aspects of who I am into, into my life and make sense of them. So that's the first thing I wanted to say about um, collaborating with self. The second thing I want to say under this topic is finding heart. So after, after I had the period of being burnt out to rugby and law and kind of not really honoring what was important to me, I then went in to become a support worker for people with learning disabilities, autism, uh, mental health issues and that was one of the first times in my life where I found heart my, my heart opened I found connection with people I wasn't driving to be anything I was just you know connecting with people mainly in East London helping them live independently when they had quite quite severe um, circumstances that they had to, to, had to overcome so that knocked me into a, a more human relationship with myself and that's when I found meditation and like many people on this call you can probably remember or you may remember the first time that you came across meditation or mindfulness and, and what impact that may have had on you and for me it had an immediate heart opening um, experience and I knew um, I started meditating and then six six weeks later I went on a retreat very skeptical like what the hell is this like hippie thing I'm doing 
And then after that retreat, I knew that, that my life was going to change. I didn't know how, but I knew something had opened in me that could hold both the athlete and the sensitive person that I am. So I went through this process of opening my heart. And then the third part of collaborating with self is the, the meditator starting to speak with the athlete. And, and I spent six years at the six or seven years at the London Buddhist Center, where I did the ordination training within the Tree Ratna Buddhist um, order. And I also managed Breathing Space, which is the secular mindfulness project. And I took a bit of a sabbatical from my ordinary life and I just committed to living in that way. And in that time, it was almost like the sensitive side of me got some space and some time to catch up with the rest of me. Um, and, I, and I found a, yeah, a new way to live. And that was where I learned mindfulness um, amongst other places where I, I got taught mindfulness. I lived in that context for a number of years and it was a really powerful way to, to bring myself into balance. But what happened in about year four and a half was I got chronic back pain and I was unable to sit down for two years. So I was a, a standing up meditation teacher for two years. And I'd come to the end of doing all the ordination training and I felt really stuck. What do I do now? I had a big block in my life and I couldn't, literally couldn't sit down. And I knew intuitively I needed to make a shift. So at that point um, is when, you know, to cut a long story short, that's when the outer collaboration and the collaboration with the world started for me in a different way. And I decided I'm going to take my understanding of mindfulness. I'm going to take it into the sports world. I'm going to take it back into address some of the issues that I came across in my own time as an athlete and what I'd seen with my friends, but take this learning back into an environment and a world that felt closer to my life. So I spent a year um, working with um, the Harlequins rugby team, which are a um, premiership rugby team. And I just got to hang out with them over a year, got, got to know them, got to teach them meditation. And as that was happening, I was in a way being re-traumatized because the athlete in me got brought up the bits of me that I never brought into my ordination training or my my mindfulness world got really activated. And I got this opportunity for the athlete and the meditator to literally start talking inside myself. And I went through this year of, of teaching meditation to these to this amazing rugby team. And they took me seriously, but they took me seriously as an athlete, but also a sensitive man who had something to offer them um, within the pressures of their life. So I went through this, this healing process and collaborating with this sports team um, for, for one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. And then out of that, um, one of the influences amongst many um, was, okay, I'm feeling more whole now. Like I'm starting to like make sense of mindfulness from my own conditioning and other people are responding to that. And that's where one of the inspirations for BAM, Boxing and Mindfulness, was, was putting together this athlete and this meditator, the vigor expression, vigorous expression of boxing with the sensitivity of, of meditation and how they marry up and seeing seeing how young people interacted with this new image and this new this new this new voice and uh, way of presenting mindfulness. So that was one of the one of the driving forces to bring about BAM. So that is my journey of self collaboration, starting with big conflict, ending in something that really made sense of my life on a deep level. And then seeing how that impacted other people. So that's 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 where collaboration starts. It's got to be something that touches you quite deeply, in my, my opinion. Because if it does touch you that deeply, chances are it's going to bring with it a hell of a lot of energy. And you need a hell of a lot of energy to withstand the ups and downs and the trials and tribulations of bringing an idea into life. And withstanding the challenges of collaborating and coming up against you know what's trying to emerge in your collaboration as opposed to an idea that you might be following okay so the next part i'm going to talk about is collaborating with the world around us so if you want to move to the next slide so this image is an image of the first cohort of boxing and mindfulness practitioners um which are now delivering bam in the world and, and i look at that and i i feel a warmth in my heart when i look at this group of people because we, we went on an amazing uh, amazing journey of learning how to how to teach BAM to other people. So where I'd like to start with this heading is collaborating with the world around us. The first title I've got is Incubating Your Idea. There's no point in, well, looking back at my own experience, I needed to incubate my idea. And what, what I mean by that is if you've got an idea and you want to collaborate with people, first of all, speak to a few people that you really trust because ideas and innovation can be very fragile at the start. I didn't have any confidence in BAM 
all going into the sports world and teaching mindfulness. And it was a couple of friends, my friend Will and Matt, who believed in the idea before I did. And they could tell by the way I talked about what I wanted to do, that it was coming from somewhere deeper than my ego and just an idea. It was, it was something about the congruence of my life. So good friends and people that can really see you and value you can help you incubate an idea and get the confidence to, to move forward with it and start to collaborate. If you don't incubate it properly and you start telling lots of people and you're not ready, it can sometimes knock your confidence or people don't always support innovation. So you've got to, there's that, for me, there was a moment where incubation was really important and getting good friends around. The second point I'd like to talk about is imperfect testing. So once you've got an idea and you want to collaborate and, it, and, you, and you think it's innovative, test it. And for me, uh, the testing didn't go according to plan. So the first time we tested BAM, we went to a community center in Leighton Nobody turned up to the session and um, was a bit like, OK, right, what, what are we going to do here? There were four people, four or five young people smoking cannabis in the side to the side of the community center. And we decided, right, we're going to we're going to try and engage these young people. They didn't they, they, they weren't too happy. They weren't. But we managed to have a conversation with them. They gave it a go. And we delivered our very first band session with with that cohort of young people. Yeah, they were high at the time, but they did the session. And at the end, they had a spark in their eye. And it was it was a combination of marijuana and BAM. But what I did pick up on was there was definitely this connectedness between us after going through the calm of meditation, the vigor vigorous expression of boxing and the calm of meditation again. There was something that connected us. And it was quite a powerful moment. And I had a, 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 a feeling of energy that there was something right in, in what we were doing that then gave the confidence for us to apply for some money to then test a bit more formally. So then we got about £5,000 after our second funding bid application. Our first one was rejected. We got about £5,000 and we tested BAM as an eight-week course at the East London Boxing Academy. Um, 25 young people attended, 20 people finished the course and the feedback was amazing. And again, this consistent um, feeling uh, and, 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 and looking at young people after they've completed BAM and their eyes are light sparking or if you've, if you've been on a retreat and you're quite connected and you can see that spark in people's eyes this was happening and young people were feeling that uh, more embodied connection that I'd been searching for for many many years through trying to put together the athlete and the meditator I was starting to see young people have that same feeling of what it's like to be more whole so that's that's what happened with the testing, the incubating, the testing. Um, and then the final part I'd like to talk about is trusting what emerges. So you've 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 come up, you've collaborated with yourself, you've tested your idea, you're starting to collaborate with the world and learn from um, what's going on with how the world's interacting, how people are interacting with, with the innovation. And then the final point is trusting what emerges. And this for me was a really big learning, and I'm still learning so much about trusting what's actually trying to emerge with BAM, as opposed to me putting ideas on how it should develop, really getting people and who, who's in, the people that are interacting with BAM to dictate how it moves forward. And I had to learn some difficult lessons um, in, in terms of trusting what, what, emerged, what, was, what is emerging with BAM. So the first thing is getting out of the way. I had to learn to get out of the way of myself. I'd been delivering BAM for three or four years um, and noticed that we had a group of youth workers and young people that had been shadowing me and naturally started started delivering BAM and being taught to deliver it. And I didn't even realize this was going on. And then we, we got some money to then empower them to teach. And then I got to this point where I was completely exhausted. Um, I put loads of time and energy into creating BAM. And I realized that the people that were now delivering it were delivering it better than I was. And I felt completely redundant. And I was like, OK, I've, I've created this thing. What what do I do now? And I had this moment of just being exhausted and just not wanting to go any going go, go any further with it. You know, and I did I didn't feel useful to the project. I felt so I went through this this period of of first of all, accepting that I was exhausted and that I wasn't, you know, didn't feel very valued. And in that process of letting go of BAM and actually realizing I'm going to let go of this for a bit and, and see what and see if that's it. it. Was this just a thing that I wanted to do? And in that period, something burned off inside me and it, and it became so obvious what was necessary and what was happening was that I just trained people to deliver BAM. And that was my role. 
I need to get out of the way of needing to be the, the coach or the person that facilitates and, and empower the people that have got more experience of working with young people, have got different life experiences that I have, are closer to the young people's experiences, working boxing gyms, are youth workers. These are the people that I had been empowering. I just couldn't see that that was the way forward because I was so caught up in being the coach or the founder of BAM or whatever was going on. So I went for a period of letting go of BAM and then what re-emerged almost, almost like a springboard was the, the training program. Um, and I remember meeting Mia. I don't know if, you're on, if Mia's on the call or not, but we, um, we started collaborating together. We started collaborating together maybe six or seven years ago. And, um, and it was when we reconnected, it was like we just picked up a thread and we spent two days together and we created this training program and it landed with such a strong, intuitive gut feeling. And we, would, we were just like, done, like, this is it. And so then we created this framework to then test BAM as a training program. But what I realize now is we, the training program was created four years ago when, I, when, when youth workers and boxing coaches and young people were, were shadowing and learning how to do it. This training program that we've now created just has just codified that process. So where we've got to with the collaboration is um, partnering with Mind since the Innovation Award last year. And we've created the BAM PTP, which is the practitioner training program. And we've just trained 20 uh, mental health practitioners to deliver BAM. Um, and this leads to my final point, which is finding a collective spirit. So where we are with BAM now is that we've just trained um, a group of LGBTQ plus and uh, Rainbow Mind and Irie Mind, which is a project for young black men. And we've trained 10 of their practitioners to deliver BAM within their services. And what I found really heartening about delivering this uh, training to, to this cohort of two different cohorts of people was it took away, you know, and my reflections are that BAM comes from a very personal thing within my life, the split between an athlete and a meditator. And as I now start to train other people who I don't have the same life experience of, there is something collective in it that we're all longing to be more connected to our bodies. And I'm finding it an honor to watch very different people with very different uh, life experiences than mine take on this training with an understanding of their own pain, their own suffering, their own lives, but also see this collective spirit emerging that we're all longing to be more embodied. We're all longing to experience more mind and body connection, which is what BAM gives. So I can feel this, I can feel, I can see BAM as an approach that has this ability to be uniquely personalized to different cohorts of people in society, but also carries this collective spirit that we're all longing to be whole, we're all longing to be connected to our bodies. Um, and I guess in some ways, uh, everyone on this call will resonate with that because mindfulness practice for me, when I drop into connection or when we started that first meditation, I started to come home to my actual body. Um, and that's the collective spirit that's coming out within BAM that I'm just loving, uh, surrendering to and learning from the people that we're now um, teaching to take this out into their own communities. So that's the journey of BAM. So just to give you a, a whistle top, whistle stop tour of the headlines again collaborate with yourself collaborate with the world around you and trust what emerges these are some of the brands and collaborations that we've been working with um, within mpp over the last five years and for the next two or three minutes i'm going to share the video which will show you the journey of our bam ptp training program um yeah that feels like i've given you a lot of info there so enjoy watching the video and if there's any questions that emerge um i think there's a bit of time at the end Thank you. Anger, tension, 
and frustration and then that, that kind of showed me that boxing and meditation works. It makes me feel more resilient. people into their bodies in a healthy way, in a safe space, to be your own container, I think for some people that's a lifelong challenge and I guess particularly for some people who may, you know, trans community who really struggle with um, radical self-care, who struggle with perhaps aspects of their physicality or maybe they're going through reassignments. Um, I think um, to have an, an, an kind of a moment by moment positive experience of your own body and to be able to connect to that is that for me is I think really, really powerful. I see so needed so much with, with young people that they're, they're distracted, they're anxious, they, they're seeing all sorts of you know, trauma and, and difficulties and this could be a way of, of just giving them an insight that, you know, they can manage their own mind and emotions, which... After I did the, um, the meditation after the workout, it kind of showed me that um, the more your heart is um, pumped up, so en energised, the more life you have. You know, one of the guys has spoken, spoken about it, about being a healing process for many of the clients. Many of the clients that we've worked with have gone through a number of, had a number of experiences not so great. And so the team has said they can see it being something that's really about the mind, body and soul. And it's been a really gentle process and something that, you know, you can just really get into without really overthinking the process. So I can see it really being effective in terms of working with this community. Brilliant. I think if we were in person, there would be a, a round of applause, but maybe we just... It's really great, Luke. Thank you so much. Really, really great. Um, so inspiring on so many levels, just um, hearing you talk so personally and candidly about your experience. We only have a few minutes left um, for, for... Well, we, we only have a few minutes. We have a few... <laughs> Uh, minutes, so let's make the most of it. Um, I'm going to uh, hand over to anyone who wants to ask a question. Please, please raise your hand, and then I'll just call on you. And if you'd like to speak your question, you can uh, alternatively you can put it in the chat box, and um, I'll, I'll I'll say it out. It can also just be something you want to share with Luke, if if it's not a question. I have a question. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Is Hi. That... Hi, Luke. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Hi. Thank you so <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your story today. Um, what I'd love to know is when you decided to put the program together, did, was that something, did you have to go through any kind of process or was it like this is our program and then you went out and did it did you have to send it anywhere for 
accreditation or anything like that? How would that work? Well, I, <clears throat> I, I think I've got it on uh, Mia Chambers, who may be on the call, who um, also was an innovation winner last year. And Mia has worked on, on mindfulness training programs in, in the past. So I had that mm. experience next to me co-creating the content. But we decided to co-create an outline and then test it and see what the people made of it. So it was a loose outline. Um, and we, so we put our minds together and then we tested it and it mm. seemed to work. So it was a, it was a pilot. So we, we, we piloted it and it worked really, really well. So it was it was um it was the collaboration with Mia and also Mia's involvement with Mind the charity Mind, okay. um, and also that's led to us now um, working with with Breathworks. I can see Colin, you're on the call. We're, we're who who are another. So again, we're looking for organisations and partnerships where there's a lot of expertise and experience in training mm. program. We don't we don't have that that experience. Um, so yeah, I think I think if you are thinking about creating a training program, look for. Look for people that hold knowledge, even if it's not an organization, people that have created training programs in the past and Matt, try and bring your knowledge into relationship with that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for your stories. Amazing. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question if, um, if that's okay, Luke. Um, my yeah. question is, you just said it's a pilot. So were, were there any interesting surprising learnings from from that and, and things you're going to iterate about the program for next time i think the first the, the surprising thing for me was that it worked because i i didn't have any had a gut feeling but i couldn't see it i couldn't see people i couldn't see it working in my in my head oh can you hear me yes my screen's gone i mean for me it was just seeing people get it and and actually deliver it and practically getting a feel for it. I didn't know whether they would in the time that we were training them. So it was it was remarkable how quickly they got the concepts experientially because we were integrating a lot of physical movement into the training and getting people really connected to their body and trusting their embodied sense of what we were doing. So that that was really that was really surprising. Um, yeah, the whole the whole thing was. Um, just seeing how it worked directly with people and it, we were just very reassured and very guided by um how people received it experientially yeah amazing okay. it's probably too soon because we've only just finished it so i've got lots of ideas and we're, we're still get, getting feedback from the people um who are now delivering so there's a lot of, a lot of ideas to, and new things to gather up over the next period yep um we've got a question from Zimena, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yes, yes. Thank you, Luke. Uh, very, very impressive your process. Um, I have a question about the training, the moment where you were exhausted and um, so you are passing the baton, but also you are creating, uh, did you create a, a team of trainers? And also that's the first question. And the other is then how, how did you plan it? with others and how did you fund it? So we, the initial model was getting funding to pilot BAM. Um, and then there was a group of youth workers and boxing coaches that got very connected and young people that got very connected to BAM. So they became part of the first cohort of people that would, would, would shadow me initially and then gain the confidence to start delivering themselves. So that was the first wave, if you like. And then, thinking there was that juncture where I was exhausted and like, how are we, are we going to grow a team of teachers or, or are we going to, and that's in that tension and letting go of the project for a while is when the training program um, step emerged and the new wave of energy came from that as a way of getting this out there. And I guess I was really taken and inspired by how youth workers and boxing coaches had taken to the approach and how close they were to the young people and the light and the life experience that they had they had more trusting bonds in the community than me coming in. Um, so that felt like the sweet spot to train and empower those people. Um, and that's what became clear. Um, in terms of the funding, we, we sought we sought funding from so many different places, but it's mainly been, it started with the Paul Hamlin Foundation, which <clears throat> anyone that's an innovator, they've got an innovation award. 
which provides funding for, for, for ideas, basically, just raw ideas. And that they gave us £10,000 and we, we got 12 months to kind of just go out and talk to young people, talk to youth workers, test some things. And then we got £5,000 to do a course um, with the Mayor of London. Um, National Lottery is also a great resource for, um, for money to pilot things. So, yeah, funding from, from funding bodies. Thank you very much and congratulations again. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, we're going to have to pause the questions, unfortunately, now, uh, Luke, but uh, gr great to hear the stories and uh, also really happy that um, this collaboration between MIND and, and um, BAM kind of was, was catalyzed by the, by the fact that you were all involved in the awards last year. Sure, makes me very yeah. happy. So that's really great to to see the ripples of that. Um, yeah. We will have some more time in the plenary to to come back to Luke if we have more questions. But for right now, I want to hand over to um, another pretty inspiring person, Vin uh, Harris, who is an experienced mindfulness teacher. He is the co-founder of Heart No Trust and has been a funder and much more than that, a, a close collaborator, a friend, an ally to all the work uh, that we've been doing at the Mindfulness Initiative over the past few years with the awards and the films. Uh, he's such a delight to work with and nearly everyone I know who is developing a creative new idea in this space considers him a mentor on some level, it seems, and um, um, unsurprising. Uh, so he's widely respected and um, with much affection, I invite him to take us through the next part of today's gathering. Thanks, Minka. It was, I mean, I, I know Luke's project and what he's been doing quite well. And uh, every time I, I, I still feel inspired, you know, to, to see how the journey's continuing. And, and as people have mentioned that, there are some of the other sort of finalists and um, uh, um, people who are involved in applying uh, to the Innovation Awards uh, with us here. And actually, I was involved in reading through every single one of the, I think it was 38 uh, applications. And some of them just brought tears to my eyes, just the amazing work that people were doing. And I think the, if there was one key point that that really touches me or that seems to make the innovation happen is that people didn't wait they took the first step they didn't have a perfect plan mm. they just started you know and luke's was a great example of that turning up and working with who he found and i think i think that's the case with 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 all of them so it's inspiring and it's great to be inspired by others but you know We've got this great opportunity here. I'm going to share a few ideas and then share some questions that we can go into breakout rooms. And you've got fellow innovators, fellow mindfulness practitioners to, to share your ideas with. And I think that's a great opportunity. As a, as a mindfulness teacher and someone who sometimes teaches others, something that really strikes me, which is kind of obvious, but it never ceases to amaze me, is that whenever people get a kind of glimpse of inner freedom through mindfulness practice, which can happen quite soon, I've never, ever yet heard anybody think, I want to keep that to myself. It can't possibly happen. There's an instinctive wish, an aspiration to share it. A kind of sense that I wish I'd known that earlier. I don't want other people to have to suffer if I can help it. So there's this instinctive aspiration. But then how do we turn that into an idea that we can implement that can then create some action that is getting, then going to genuinely benefit other people? Luke and, and, and many others have done. When I first read the, the, the innovation field book, when it, when it first came out, as an entrepreneur, I was, I was really uh, inspired by it. Um, I felt it was a kind of an encouragement, a permission 
um, an acknowledgement that it was time for the mindfulness industry or field to be a bit mature, to, to be more confident, and to really reach out to more and more parts of our society to make mindfulness more accessible, that we really needed to do this. But with the fantastic encouragement too, that we can't and we don't need to change the essence of mindfulness. Mindfulness is what it is. It's essentially very simple. And so the, the, the challenge really that I think the field book puts out is how do we retain that simplicity and integrity, but find different ways to present mindfulness so that it really can reach the parts of society where it's needed to be more inclusive, to be more available to everybody. So, what we're going to do um, is work with some innovation questions or prompts, you might call them. Um, I would hate it if, if, if uh, you thought there were five steps to being an innovator or something like that. That's not going to happen, right? And in fact, I, I'll tell you where I got these from. I, I was working on a totally different project. It wasn't to do with mindfulness, um, with, uh, with some young friends. And um, this young woman from Australia called uh, Hayley, she was talking about how she kind of came up with ideas. And um, she said uh, her, her example was that she was a fitness trainer. And uh, she said it was so boring. Fitness trainer is so boring. And she joined lots of different clubs and she went and taught at different clubs. And she said, everybody was so bloody unfriendly. She said, I decided that I was going to do something different. And I was going to start an exercise class that when people got there, I, I welcomed them and we chatted with them as well as doing some exercise. And she kind of discerned these five um, principles, if you like, of what seems to happen in innovation. When I look back on my own life, I think I observed that. I'll, I'll read them out. You don't need to write them down because when you go into the breakout rooms, they're going to be posted in the chat box so that you can kind of discuss them with your, with your colleagues. But the first one's this, it's who you are and what's the field of your interest and experience? And, you know, sometimes when people particularly finish training to teach mindfulness, they kind of see themselves like a baby mindfulness teacher and they don't know what to do. And they seem to forget that they've got, a, even if they're not very old, they've got a whole lifetime of experience. And like Luke talking about bringing his athleticism, bringing his own challenges into it. And... Then the next question that we ask ourselves is what's wrong in that field? What's missing? What could be better? I mean, I know as mindfulness practitioners, we're supposed to be non-judgmental, but I think it's really okay to ask yourself, what is messed up in the field that I'm working in? What could be better? What could we do differently? And I'm, I'm going to relate this to actually how these innovation awards came about, because um, as a mindfulness teacher and practitioner, you can't choose the things that bother you. But it really bothered me that people were training to teach mindfulness out of the best of compassionate, heartfelt intention, and then you were stuck, and the world was being deprived of their gifts. It bothered me, and it still bothers me. And I wanted to do something about it. And I didn't see much... I mean, I thought the innovation fieldwork was a huge step in the right direction, but I didn't see much out there that was giving people the skills that they also needed to be able to create opportunities to teach. Creating great mindfulness teachers, but how are they going to find the opportunities? So then the next question that we have is, how are you uniquely positioned to improve the situation? And in my case, you know, I've got a small charity trust that we started. I kind of know about mindfulness. And I thought, what can I do um, as an entrepreneur? 
and I had to kind of sit with that. You know, this isn't a sort of magic formula, but just sitting with that. And as a, an entrepreneur built a small business and did, did very well with it, um, we used to win awards. And I was aware of the, the, the leaps forward that these awards gave us. So I thought, well, we don't have infinite amounts of money. I'd love to just fund everybody's mindfulness project. Can't do that, unfortunately. But I thought, if we could make an award that would celebrate achievement and would kind of wave a flag and people see people like Luke and, and the other award winners here, then they're going to say, well, yeah, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could apply those same principles. So in terms of being uniquely positioned, well, that was part of it, but I didn't know that many people. And so, like Luke suggested, I talked to a few friends, checked out the idea, and people said, yeah, but I'm not quite sure how to make it happen. And just one day, I kind of thought, why don't I talk to the Mindfulness Initiative? And it took a bit of bravery, and it took some contact through some good friends, and, and I talked with Jamie, and, you know, it, it does seem a bit counterintuitive having a mindfulness competition, doesn't it? But when we kind of kicked it around, the idea emerged. And then we, we kind of created a little team. And when I'm working with Menka, which is just an amazing privilege, and, and with the other people within the Mindfulness Initiative. So it's this collaboration. We collaborated together. And then we didn't kind of say, oh, we need to figure out a brand. We need to do this, this, and that. We just did it. You know, we, we launched the brand, launched the launched the awards, and said, "Well, what can we afford? What can we do?" And here we are. So it's just taking that first step, but definitely collaborating, and then it is amazing the amount of people who are willing to help. Some really highly respected people in the mindfulness field kind of offered their time as judges to help with that. And we had the awards event, and here we are now. And so how would I have dreamt that to be here and having this opportunity to listen to Luke and Menka and to talk with everybody would have come from that idea? So that, that's my encouragement, is we, we take the first step and we don't worry too much about where it's going to lead. So... Maybe when you go into groups, you could look at this two ways. It may be that you've got a kind of live idea that you'd want to have the opportunity to voice with other people and get their feedback and comments and support. Um, or maybe just reflecting on this, you can see how these principles have played out in the past for you and brought you to where you are now. So you might want to share from that. And I think either would be very valid. We now have um, 15 minutes for a plenary. And um, I will invite um, you all to, to um, consider sharing something from, uh, from what you, you know, what you gained from that, uh, from that brief conversation with your peers. Uh, Shannon saying that was really fun and inspiring. Brilliant. So if anyone wants to um, speak, just um, put your hand up and then unmute and um, go for it. And Anne-Marie? Yeah. Can you go first? Um, I was, um, uh, in the, during our session, we were talking very much about how um, uh, the way one of the ways forward very much seems to be um, uh, embodied in Luke's approach, uh, uh, but it came up partly because I um, too have found that a way into uh, teaching mindfulness to specific populations is to start from the point of view of uh, movement. So. Um, I'm teaching um, an older older population um, mindfulness through Tai Chi and Qigong, where the Tai the movement element is um, where people are drawn in, and then the mindfulness almost comes along um, 
uh, not secondary to the movement, but the movement is a way to introduce a population who maybe wouldn't wouldn't necessarily um, be inspired to join a mindfulness group, but who mm. who are inspired to join a, a group that involves movement. And um, then they discover mindfulness through movement and um, are hooked very, very quickly because there is this um, really very strong mind-body connection. And um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, a hugely underexplored way forward for making mindfulness accessible to much wider populations. Thank you and for sharing that's, that's that. That's what we were discussing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Mark um, wants to say something, but Luke, was that a response to what Anne Marie just said? Then you want to go? Just very quickly, on <clears throat> we, we are changing the acronym of BAM to Body Mind Training to include a lot more different types of physical movement to tailor to different groups. So it might be more vigorous boxing elements with young people, but it might be with different groups. We use different physical um, intervention. So yeah, I just really agree that it's a, it's a great way to kind of bring broaden mindfulness and make it more embodied. Um, yeah. But anyway, I said enough tonight, so I'll ha I will hand over to other people. Could I add something, maybe? Uh, Mark. Oh, Vin's in. Go ahead, Mark's Vin. had his hand up for, for a while, so maybe we can go to him next. Uh, well, let Vin, let, let Vin go ahead first, and then I'll... I'll... Oh, just, just, just a quick words. comment that... Um, I, I think we need, like the, what was the word Anne-Marie used, like a hook. You know, it's finding a hook that engages people's interest. And it's not sneaky, you know, no. but it. people don't say, I'd like to learn mindfulness. Probably all of us that wanted to just think that way have done it. And I think that's why innovation becomes really important. Mm. Thanks, Vin. Um, Mark? Yeah, um... Something that came up at the end of the group, something I was saying at the end of the group, so a realisation. So firstly, thank you um, for this event. Thank you, Vin, for your questions. I, I thought before I came along, I knew what I wanted to do, um, because I've been doing some stuff around addiction stuff. And uh, like anne I use a lot of mindful movement. I'm a yoga teacher as well, and I've been... But I, I but I've got another thing. I've got I've got Crohn's disease, and I realised that I realised tonight that that's where I need to focus my attention. It, it, it's, it's, it's where... Yeah, I, I realised when I was talking about it earlier that that's where my rational really does lie. Um, but that's not what I wanted to say. What I want to say is I think this is a great opportunity to share things and listening to the other people. And I think the awards ceremony and the awards, the awards thing is fantastic and the opportunity to go to London and listen to a few of the finalists and stuff. Um, but can I put something forward as a suggestion? Maybe making it more than just a, an awards ceremony announcing winners, that maybe have a have a two-day conference around mindfulness and innovation where we can all get a chance just to talk with each other and share those ideas that we've all got, that we've all got to inspire and, and to, to innovate and find those links to collaborate. I was with three other people in my group and I could see straight away ways, ways in which I could collaborate with each and every one of those people. Some in terms of how they could help with my stuff, but somehow I could potentially help with their stuff. If we could get together, how powerful that would be. And yes, doing it online is lovely and wonderful and has its advantages, but actually spending some time together and really taking that energy from each other and that shared passion from each other and making it real, um, that can take it beyond the one or two people who are fortunate enough to, to win the award. So taking away from that competition bit that Vin mentioned earlier. So that, that was what I wanted to share rather than my own personal stuff. It was just thank you and just throw out that out there that you know if there's any chance of creating something like that, I think that would be wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Um, maybe we can have uh, Tish next. Um, yeah, um, I was in a group with uh, Mark and yeah, um, yeah, I love that idea of a conference as well. Um, I've got an idea which I think would take um, could possibly take quite a lot of collaboration, but I'd like to see a mindfulness project in a refugee camp or in refugee camps 
And, um, you know, I was thinking about Luke, um, his beautiful presentation, him talking about his own experience and also seeing his artwork. Um, my idea is that something like mindfulness, movement, art, sort of going into a refugee. And I think that, you know, maybe a lot of us could get together and collaborate because you're obviously not going to just do it as one mindfulness teacher. But I think if anybody needs, you know, if anybody needs support, it's refugees and it's people in refugee camps. So I just want to raise that as an idea. It's something that's on my mind at the moment. And I'm like, can I make this happen? Could we make this happen? I have seen a documentary, I think 100 Days of Mindfulness, where someone did go into a, mindf um, a refugee camp and it had a really positive effect. But I just want to throw that out there that there's so much experience in this room and different experience and just um, how, you know, how could we have a really positive impact on people who would never come into, mindf in, into mindfulness and maybe even you know, find ways that they, they could maybe have an art exhibition or something like mindfulness and art and movement. And so anyway, blah, blah, blah. I'm just, this is my idea. And I am a bit of a entrepreneur and I am a bit of a pioneer and I am quite good at making things happen, but I need help. So that's just my idea. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Just my idea. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share that, um, there is somebody called Priyanka Malhotra who's been working with refugees in the UK. She's a breathworks trained mindfulness teacher. So yeah, just if, oh, one I'd of many people that you I'd might want to collaborate with. Yeah, I'd love to uh, get her name. Would you put it in the chat, please, Minka? Um, yes, we'll do. Uh, we've got Ruth Davy next. Hi, everyone. And I'm really apologize for any noise. I'm in a pub and my AirPods have run out of juice. So I'm really sorry if it's really noisy. Um, I just wanted to pick up on on what um, Tish was just saying because um, I, I, I've i done quite a lot of work with asylum seekers and refugees and with various hats on, um, but there's a pro, um, there's, I'm, I'm working with an organization as a trust at the moment. I'm based in Gloucestershire in Stroud and it's called, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember what it's called. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a place that specifically gives support and respite to, to asylum seekers and refugees um, and uh, they're looking for opportunities and and funding etc and I mean I, I'm going I'm already working with them to develop some mindful photography work that I that I'm involved with but I know that there's all kinds of interest with the people that I'm working with in how that can be developed more and it's it's a beautiful place it's not very it's not very big but there's you know there's catering facilities there's there's rooms it's beautiful a lovely garden for you know gardening and all sorts of stuff um so if anyone wants to know more um about refugee related opportunities please get in touch amazing ruth do you want to put your details in the chat in case anyone does want to take you up on that offer we have um something from nathan yeah, just to say, um, I'm probably jumping the gun. So I'm the CEO in waiting uh, for Breathworks. So I'm not yet appointed. I'm starting in January. But that is exactly the sort of thing that I would love to do. So if we, the three of us or whoever else, could um, exchange details, that would be brilliant. That was it, really. Thanks. This is it. This is how just an idea becomes... The yeah. idea. <laughs> idea. Love it. Um, Tish, did you have your hand up from before? Or did you want to say something else? Oh, no. I just wanted to say, Nathan, yes, please, yes, please, yes, please. Could we? Yeah, yeah. So I'd love to swap contacts. Yeah. Sorry, Minka. So, so, so there's a way of direct messaging each other on, on here um, or okay. just put it in the chat okay. if, if, you, if you want everyone to have your details. Thank you. Well, we're waiting for, for somebody else to put up their hand. Okay, we have um, someone saying that they've got experience in uh, listening to migrations. So that's in the chat. Um, I, I wanted to share something that came up in our group, which I think is a little bit of a white white elephant. Is that, is it, I don't know why I've just said white elephant, but an elephant in the room, <laughs> anyways. And, um, it's to do with um, accreditation. So the question came up earlier and 
uh, the the thing is about um, developing something new and and you know what kind of what kind of approvals do we need you know um, to 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 be able to say this this is this is for real this is um, this works and and um, of course um, there's uh, there's kind of informal uh, organizations like Bamba and Iamba and um, um, others similar ones around the world which I think are doing a fantastic job of of trying and mostly volunteer run and trying trying to trying to kind of um, create kind of a a a, a sense of of um, a, a sense of like standards, you know, um, and and also safety. Um, and I think that um, they are going through a process of trying to uh, encourage innovation um, at, at the same time as doing that. Um, and I think that's a tricky role to be playing. But what I what I uh, wanted to share was that you know that there's also another route, which is just building up your evidence. And I think there's there's like you know starting from just using psychological scales to to survey people that are uh, the, the ten people that you're you're doing a little prototype or pilot with, um, through to actually partnering with a research organization to um, to do um, some larger scale studies, longer term scale studies, RCTs eventually. But the but the point is that it doesn't have it's 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 um. It's it, it's like it's known as an evidence um, kind of pyramid, you know. It, it, you can move up, and um, you can start anywhere on there. And I think that um, that is like a really powerful way to to. And we haven't talked about it much today, but that is uh, probably the most foolproof way of of um, getting your stripes, you know. So that's uh, like it's universal, and uh, it. Um, it, it makes sense in the workplace and it makes sense in the community It makes sense in media. So to, to really think from very early stages, like what is the strategy for building up my evidence, starting small and, and growing from that. I hope that was useful. Um, does anyone else have a question or you, Jake? There we go. Um, I guess a first question popped up and it's a little bit of research and the idea I have is a product based technology idea. And if anybody has any experience, advice, knowledge on posture, uh, sitting and chair design, that would be of interest. So Jake, am I, Am I right in understanding your question is, does anyone in this group have expertise around around posture and chair design? Because you have a, a, a idea for for a, a new kind of chair, is that? Um, for possibly. mindfulness? Okay. <laughs> yeah, mindful, a mindfulness chair. Okay. A, okay right. a breath chair. Oh, wow. Great. Okay. That's exciting. So yeah, if anyone has uh, wants to reach out to Jake on that. Thank you. This is another thing that we've found when we're doing the awards is that it's really hard to compare a training program with a product as well, like in, in terms of um, innovation for you. It's great to, to see that happening. Um, we have another hand, uh, Zana, Zana? Zana, yeah, hi, thank you. I wanted to ask Luke a question if that was possible. I just wondered, and I lost my sound for a while, so it may already have been said. I just wondered if his training was going to extend beyond London area, like I'm up in Scotland and um, ran a school for nearly 20 years that involved teaching remedial sports massage. And we had quite a lot of boxers came on it and um, were balancing that gentler side with the anger issues that they had. So I'm sure they would be interested. So I don't know if that's a possibility. Luke, are you I, looking for the unmute? Yes, yeah. sorry, I, I couldn't, couldn't get my mute button off. Um, yes, but the question is when. the next Our next planned scale is London and, and Manchester. And then we do want... Yeah, I've got, I've got an ambition for this to be UK wide, but it's a it's a question of when 
Yeah. So the best thing would be for the, me to give the contact details of BAM and then for just to watch what's happening or, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. say interest. Yeah. Okay. I mean, already, we delivered it. We delivered our first training program about two months ago and I've had two youth services in East London reach out and, and both wanted to train 15 staff. Right. So that's, okay. happened, that's happened in the last two weeks. So it's like, yeah. that's there's been a ripple effect from, from the training already. Oh, that's scary. Yeah. I think one of them that particularly I'm thinking of was really trying to help some of the boxers that came to his gym yeah. with um, it's kind of Thai boxing he does with um, their anger issues. So if he's still, I haven't seen him for years, but if he's still, I'm sure he would be interested in that. Okay. Thanks for that. Keep in touch and drop me an email. Um, cause I'm yeah. sure we'll put a newsletter around this at some point and can keep you abreast of what we're doing. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks. Thank Luke, you. if you're happy for people to get in touch, maybe you want to drop your details as well yeah. in, the, in the chat box. I'm sure that'd be appreciated. I want to um, ask um, Dean or Aisha if either of you wanted to share something, just because uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. So, and for people that don't know, um, they were the um, um, winners of uh, one of the mindfulness uh, awards last year. Oh, we were just going to keep nice and quiet and, and take in all the... And you nearly got away with it, but then I saw you. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, just really, again, just inspired by the work that's going on and and the desire and wish to extend mindfulness to, to areas that it hasn't reached yet, really. I mean, personally, we've always been engaged in innovation. We know Vin as a dear friend. We have friends at MI. Um, we know we've we've got a, a connection with Luke as well many many years ago when we used to train at LBC in Bethnal Green so there's a real sense of uh, solidarity familiarity with with the whole idea and um, yeah just great to see it flourishing one thing I would say is just look for the real needs and I think I heard someone talking about um, you know they've refined their idea just today in this session and, and coming back to what matters to them. And I think that that's what, what drives us, is finding that real inner need, knowing it's needed before you innovate. There's no point in innovating for innovation's sake. It's all about really, you know, I think like Luke said, bringing your personal conflicts together and then sharing that resolution with the world. And I think it's almost guaranteed to work. So yeah, just a, just a motivation really for all of you as, as a, as an award winner last year or a runner up to 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 to, to Luke. And um yeah, long may it continue. Avid supporters of MI and the Innovation Awards. Thank you. Great place to to pause today's conversation. I'm gonna hand over to Richard. Thanks, Manka. Thank you. I got the, the job of closing this evening really. I just wanted to, to reflect on, um, on my experience of this evening as much as anything else. And, and you know, I, I find my hands going straight towards my chest because what we wanted to talk about this evening was about collaboration and working together. And, and, and that seems to be the spirit of just about everything that's come forward this evening. You know, we talk about the Mindfulness Awards um, next year being about programs and, and tech and and partnership um but i i i think that you know the idea of collaboration and, and going back to luke's journey um that he 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 brought such passion and, and warmth um to us explaining um this journey of collaborating with yourself of turning towards who you are you know of finding the heart in that of, 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 of then developing that to be able to then collaborate with the world around you um, and to not worry about testing things and it going wrong, but trusting in what comes out of that. You know, that, that's such a powerful message that, that Luke delivered there. And, and then linking that into to, to, to Vin's five steps, if you like, and, and you know, who are you? You know, we could talk about that for forever and a day. Who are you? Um, but, you know, what is your specialism? What are your skills? Who are you? 
you know, and what's wrong with that area that you work in? What's wrong with that field? How could that be better? You know, and how are you uniquely positioned to do something about that? You know, and it's a, it's a way that you can test that really, really quickly. And again, who can you work with to make this happen? And, and those five tests, in a way, are, are something that enables us to sort of reflect on the power of what we can do, the, the opportunity of what we can achieve, um, and the strength of force behind it, and the strength of heart behind it, going back to to Luke. And I think we've heard lots of different examples this evening of, of different things that could that 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 could link around that, around movement, Tai Chi, about um working with refugees and asylum seekers. Um, I love the idea of, of having a two-day conference um to talk about innovation, to bring innovators together to try and because I feel enthused after two hours of, of sitting with you guys. You know, imagine if we could spend two days doing that. Um, certainly I'm gonna go away and see whether we can do that at some point in the future. I can't promise it for 2024, um, but we'll see what we can do in terms of making that an ambition of actually moving innovation into a much bigger space, um, because I think it's something that is very much needed. So I think, you know, we want to look at inclusion. We want to look at diversity and going back to what Menka started this evening with. I think this evening um, we were invited to the party um, and I think we got to dance a bit. And I think through the different ideas, I think we can get to choose the music. Um, and I think, you know, that's where we're going. That's what we need to achieve. And so, you know, I think, you know, amazing guys. Um, thank you for your time this evening. Please keep an eye on, on, on us on LinkedIn and on social media, because when we're nearer the awards, there'll be more information dripping out. Um, and, you know, we've got a lot of work to do yet in terms of shaping that um, and maximising that and, and looking at the detail of that. Um, but, you know, it will go out on social media. So please remember this. Please start developing your ideas. Start being enthused by what we've heard this evening. Um, and when the when it is announced, please do apply. Please do encourage other people to, to apply. And if you see good innovation, shout about it. So thank you, everybody, this evening. Thank you, Menka. Thank you, Vin. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Eileen, for, for, for running it, um, pulling all the strings and making sure it works all so well. Um, thank you, everybody, that's contributed this evening. It's been amazing. Um, go well. Thank you for coming. Maybe if anyone wants to unmute and, and we can just say bye. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>